Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ben Feinstein. I'm the Director of Operations and Analysis for the Dell SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit. Uh, to my left is my colleague, Jeff Jarmok. Yeah, hi. If we could get his mic hot as well. Okay. Can we get that mic on? Um, so I'm Jeff Jarmok. I'm a, a security researcher with the Dell SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit. So today we'll be uh, giving a talk we call Get Off of My Cloud. Um, just to start with a little thought or a pictograph, if you will, this is one conception of multi-tenancy in the cloud, sort of a uh, crazy bazaar of different customers um, all sitting next to each other on the same uh, shared infrastructure. This is one way you can conceive of that. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, uh, when we set out to start this work some months ago, we wanted to first understand um, more about Amazon's cloud platform. We didn't set out to do this to pick on Amazon by any chance, but really they're, they're the uh, big gorilla in the room when it comes to public clouds and infrastructure as a service clouds. So if you're going to be doing research as it relates to public cloud and, and infrastructure cloud, really Amazon is, is the biggest uh, player right now. So we wanted to understand all the different uh, types of credentials that you use when you're using Amazon's web services. We really wanted to understand sort of the order of precedence of all those different credentials. So if you were to have one type of credential, what could you do with it and what other types of credentials could you control or uh, manipulate? Um, also understanding common mistakes and pitfalls uh, of people or organizations that are using Amazon's cloud services. So part of this is looking at best practices and the guidance that's published, but also um, understanding what are some really easy ways to make some bad mistakes out there. And then with that in mind, we uh, set off to develop a set of tools to detect um, instances of, of these problems, basically uh, cases where credentials could be exposed uh, within Amazon's virtual machine images, uh, or rather virtual machine images that are published uh, within Amazon's cloud by third parties. Um, and also these tools would detect malicious images uh, or backdoored uh, images that could be out there in the public, uh, the public set of images. Also, we performed an experiment to better quantify the scale of potential victims. If you were to release a malicious machine image, and we'll define some of these terms, so I apologize if this is some terminology up front, but if you were to release a malicious virtual machine image uh, and publish it in Amazon's cloud, uh, we did an experiment to get a sense of how many victims you could, uh, you could count on receiving and how many of those victims you might actually be able to take control of their, their virtual machine. And also throughout this work, uh, we maintained uh, our work was consistent with our reading of Amazon Web Services customer agreement and their terms of service that are published on their website. So um, people are, you know, organizations are moving all their infrastructure into the cloud at a rapid pace. Um, there's a number of reasons why they're doing that, but really it's, it's, you shouldn't fear the cloud or you shouldn't blindly embrace the cloud. It's really just a tool. Um, like any other tool, there's good uses, there's bad uses, and there's really suicidal uses. So you can think of it sort of like a knife. You know, there's obviously some good uses for knives here. Um, in this case, Crocodile Dundee, he has a knife. There's lower costs in the cloud. There's decreased time to market, which is very attractive uh, for organizations today. You can rapidly scale out your infrastructure without having to purchase data centers and hardware and servers and storage. And also, uh, you could inexpensively uh, get geographically diverse infrastructure uh, by using cloud services such as Amazon's. So there's obviously some bad uses for the cloud, just like bad uses for a knife. Uh, there's relative anonymity to be found. Um, basically, you can uh, spin up instances in different regions of the world. Uh, it's very difficult for a third party to determine who's the actual actor that's behind that virtual machine image or behind that IP address that's sitting in Amazon's cloud. Um, it's it's uh, inexpensive, or if you perhaps have stolen credit cards or you've stolen credentials to other cloud users, it's free. Um, it's very hard for defenders to blacklist cloud infrastructure. Um, the IP addresses are ephemeral. They change rapidly. Um, you're going you're gonna to do a tremendous impact to your business if you just blacklist like, large swaths of Amazon's cloud because there's a lot of legitimate uses and legitimate services that are running there. Um, it makes geo, geo IP address blocking or geographical blocking much more difficult because you can just spin up a virtual instance in any number of places around the globe um, to kind of hide where, where the actual location of the, the attacker is. And again, it's highly scalable. That plays for both good and bad. If a, if a malicious party wishes to have a highly scalable infrastructure to support cybercrime or, or some other aspect, well, the cloud will offer that as well. You can, you can find uh, any number of press reports about, you know, spammers using uh, cloud services, 
Um, even malware is now starting to uh, attack cloud services. There was a case of a spy eye trojan that had been modified uh, to access Amazon S3 and, and uh, uh, compromise some buckets in that. And what we're really talking about also is the suicidal uses of the cloud here. Inadvertently, we found that many uh, many publishers of third-party images, but also many uh, users of the cloud that are using third-party images are putting themselves at great risk. So don't be this guy. You need to, uh, you know, look at the cloud, and but do it with open eyes and do it, you know, by considering the risks and looking at the best practices and making sure that you're really adhering to the published guidance out there so that you can use these cloud services but use it in a safe way and, and take, take uh, assessment of the risk. Uh, so some terminology, I apologize for those of you that are already, this is already old hat to you, but um, when we gave some dry runs of this, many, many folks weren't uh, really intimately familiar with Amazon's web services yet, and there's a whole lot of acronyms out there that we'll be using. So AWS, that's Amazon Web Services, that's sort of the overarching uh, suite of different services that they offer um, for their cloud service delivery. Uh, EC2, you'll hear us use that term. That's their Elastic Compute Cloud. It's essentially an uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, you can get shared compute storage and network through the EC2. An AMI, or uh, AMI, I've heard it called as well, is Amazon Machine Image. It's essentially, uh, what it is, it's a virtual appliance container format. So you would pick an Amazon Machine Image and you could launch any number of instances of that image uh, and those actually become virtual machines that would be running in the EC2 cloud. S3, or Simple Storage Service. Uh, that's object storage that Amazon offers its customers. Um, it, you basically uh, use what's known as buckets, and you read and write data into those buckets as objects. And then a, a, a more, uh, more recent addition, though it's, it's probably been out for a few years now, is the Elastic Block Store. And that is a, it's a virtualized block device. Just like on a Unix or Linux system, you can mount a block device on that system and read and write to it, just like a file system. EBS is a cloud file system, a cloud block device that you can uh, mount on your images there. So when we first set out to do this project, we wanted to understand all the different kinds of credentials out there um, and what, their different, what the different uses of those credentials are and then which ones control which other credentials. So there's really three broad categories of credentials for Amazon Web Services. There's access credentials, there's sign-in credentials, and then there's a set of different account identifiers that you have to use. Um, in terms of access credentials, you've got access keys. An access key is merely a, a long, unique string of uh, digits. There's a public and a secret part of that. Um, it's a little bit analogous to certificates, but there are certificates in play as well. We'll talk about those. But your access key ID also has a secret access key. And what you use that for are uh, authenticated uh, web services APIs, like SOAP APIs to use um, simple storage service, or Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, which is essentially a, a, a service where you can get real human beings to do your bidding for, uh, for pennies per request. Uh, there's a screenshot on the next slide where basically you manage all these different credentials within Amazon's uh, web console. And uh, these keys are also, the access keys are also used for CloudFront, which is Amazon's own content distribution network that they offer as part of their web services suite. Amazon's recommendation here, rotate those keys at least every 90 days. Here's a quick screenshot of the Nifty web interface where you can, uh, you can manage these access keys, um, both the secret key and the um, uh, private public key part of it. Another important um, credential is X509 certificates. So many parts of Amazon Web Services, you use a uh, certificate and private key to access or to sign your images, to bundle images. Um, these are, again, they're managed through Amazon's Web Services console, but you also can do some of this with APIs. You can generate your own uh, certificate or private key, or you can provide your own certificate. This is sort of a trade-off of convenience versus security. Um, either you let Amazon generate the secret key for you, or you do that on a system. Uh, you know, it's obviously recommended that you probably want to generate your secret key yourself and then provide uh, up to Amazon. Use it to bundle your AMIs. It cryptographically signs and encrypts uh, AMIs that are private or just cryptographically signs the machine images that you're going to make public. Again, Amazon's recommendation, rotate these things every, every 90 days. So go issue new certificate and private key at least every 90 days for your infrastructure. Another, web, uh, another screenshot here. EC2 key pairs. Um, this, is a, this is one of the biggest findings that we'll get into later uh, of what we actually found when we scanned the US East cloud. 
with our tools that we're, that we're releasing today. They're SSH key pairs for all intensive purposes. Um, when you spin up, when you, when you launch an instance of a machine image, you specify an SSH key pair for that image to load. And on boot up, it essentially loads the private, excuse me, loads the public key into the SSH authorized key file, and then you use your private key to access it to SSH and get a console on that virtual machine. So it's a very convenient way um, to, to get, ac get secure access to a virtual machine. You don't need to bake um, an authorized key file into the image itself, you specify it at runtime when you spin up a virtual machine. There's no explicit security recommendations I've found uh, from Amazon around these key pairs or rotating them uh, or such. And there's also, interestingly, uh, there's Windows virtual machines that you could run in the EC2, and these key pairs play a role there where literally the administrative RDP or remote desktop password is encrypted uh, with the private key, and you would decrypt it um, and then access the RDP port on the Windows image. So it plays a role in accessing Windows uh, images as well. And you can log into the web console and play with these things and allocate your keys and such. Um, CloudFront key pairs, uh, yet another set of credentials. What we found is there's, there's so many different, you know, access keys, private keys, key pairs, uh, cloud front key pairs that it's, it's quite confusing and really the first part of our research was just figuring out and identifying and enum enumerating all the different credentials that you have to use when you use Amazon's web services. This is the key you use when you're using their CDN network um, to generate signed URLs. Essentially a way of offering private, uh, private content within Amazon's content distribution network. So pretty much the, the one key to rule them all is the sign-in credential. This is the actual login that you log into their administrative web interface and control all aspects of your Amazon Web Services account. So this is, if you're gonna defend any of these and, and secure them um, strongly, this is probably the most important set of credentials there are. What it is, if you've, if you've ever bought a book from Amazon or a CD, it's your username and password. All you do is take a normal Amazon account, you may have purchased a book, and you activate web services on that account. And that is now, that your login to Amazon's web service is now the credential, uh, website is now the credential to your web services account. They've just uh, also offered multi-factor authentication. It's not RSA Secure ID. Um, so you can protect this with multi-factor auth. You go purchase a $12 or $13 uh, token online. You uh, activate your account with this token, and then now you've got multi-factor authentication uh, to uh, add to just the username and password to protect this. This is really important for enterprises or larger organizations that are going to be using cloud services so that you're not, your whole kingdom isn't just relying on one username and password here. And they haven't rolled out the uh, kit and retinal scan just yet. Account identifiers, there's, there's um, uh, two account identifiers. There's a canonical one, which you use for certain APIs, and there's just another ID that you use for other APIs. And uh, it's not really a secret, but it's a long string of digits that you could inadvertently expose in your images as well. So uh, as we're going through this, we found some prior research that, that we thought was interesting and we wanted to call out. So a few years ago, back at Black Hat 09, uh, DEF CON 17, a group of researchers, including Ad Alex Stamos, uh, delivered a talk called Cloud Computing Models and Vulnerabilities, Reigning on the Trendy New Parade. And they showed two, uh, among other things, they showed two interesting uh, techniques. One was a way to uh, essentially game the system to get prime placement within the list of public machine images of their own machine image. So literally there's, there's hundreds of different, say, Fedora images that are available in the public cloud. Um, and the key is if you're not really on that first page of search results, people probably aren't gonna pick your machine image. So they were doing this so that they could get a set of uh, victim users that would run, uh, I wouldn't say a backdoored machine image, but a machine image that had a phone home mechanism in it. And so they also, they gamed the system, they got prime placement for their virtual machine image, and then they had a phone home script that was running every time it, you spun it up, and they could measure how many people, um, how many people did this. There's some interesting precedent that, that was published earlier this year. So in uh, uh, Tipping Point's blog published this, uh, a copy of this letter that Amazon sent to their customers back in April. And essentially, um, 
someone had found that an image had been shared with the public that had authorized SSH keys baked into it. So the publisher of this image could potentially have full access as root to anybody that, that chose this machine image and spun up instances of it. So this also reinforced to us that this is something we wanted to look at more closely. Um, and this is why we built these tools to go ahead and uh, evaluate large numbers of machine images to look for things such as SSH authorized keys that aren't really, shouldn't be there. Jeff, you want to take over from here? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, there was, uh, after we were accepted for this talk, uh, there was a group in Germany, uh, some uh, postdoc researchers at a university there, that um, released some research that's very similar to ours. Um, they also released a tool that uh, scans AMIs uh, in a very similar fashion to what we do. Uh, their tool is a, a Python script um, that essentially you have to run on the uh, on the instance itself, whereas our tool interacts with the, uh, with the Amazon APIs to uh, spin up instances, SSH to them, uh, scan them remotely, and, and turn them down. Um, so they're, they're similar, but the approaches are slightly different. Um, and we've scanned more images and, and you know, have a little bit larger data set from our tool. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, you know, there's other people working on this, and uh, it's possible that there's, that there's others that uh, aren't publishing it. Um, so, you know, this is probably something that's being done in the wild. Um, so, when creating a uh, public AMI or uh, an AMI that you share with other users, uh, there's a number of ways that you can, uh, that you can, you can accidentally leak your own uh, credential material. Um, you know, on the file system itself, you may have your, uh, your Amazon Web Service Certificate and private key. Um, you might have SSH key pairs, either uh, you know, an authorized key that, that Ben mentioned or, uh, you know, an actual identity key. Um, you know, you might have SSL certificates and private keys that are on the image. Um, you need to be conscious uh, as a publisher of an image what you're putting out there uh, because, you know, once it's public, it is truly public and, uh, you know, anybody can, can access these images and, uh, and search for these sorts of uh, credential materials. And that's essentially what we've done. Uh, there's also uh, other ways to leak information. Bash history files is a big one. Um, if you've run the, uh, run the image as an instance yourself and uh, done any sort of work on it and, and then made a public image out of it, uh, that bash history might expose that. Um, and it might also expose some of these, uh, these credential materials that you've used. Um, files like uh, bash RC, bash profile often contain, um, you know, environment variables that are set to these values for scripts to access and things like that. Um, so we looked for these as well. Uh, and then also Vim info files. Um, you know, occasionally there's, there's a chance someone might be trying to clean up and go in and edit a file to delete it, uh, but they search for that and their, their Vim info uh, stores that search for that string. Um, you know, so it could be there as well. Um, and then we tried, uh, tried to, to do a little bit of looking for uh, signs of a, uh, of a malicious AMI. Um, this is primarily uh, the SSH authorized keys. Uh, there's possibilities for, you know, rootkits, Trojan binaries, um, you know, reverse shells, connect backs, uh, those sorts of things. Um, you know, with the PV grub kernels that they support now, you can run your own kernel on, uh, on EC2. Uh, so you could, you could uh, you know, backdoor the kernel directly um, if you wanted to. Um, there was a talk today in uh, SkyTalks, um, Anch with 303 um, demonstrated a, uh, an AMI image that, uh, you know, essentially would when it was launched, would, would phone back, download a piece of code, execute it, and he'd, it, he'd get a uh, interpreter shell from it uh, anytime somebody spun that instance up. So that's also, uh, you know, related work to this. Um, so uh, there's been other work on, on malicious AMIs. Uh, ben mentioned uh, some of the, the, the work from 2009 from DEF CON 17. Um, this is something, you know, anybody who's looked at, at Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, thinks of this, um, that, that you know, these images are public and uh, there's not much, much uh, verification of, of who the publishers are and what their intentions are. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's really difficult to detect, um, you know, malicious intent and malicious behavior. Um, so we, uh, we undertook a project to try and uh, gather some data surrounding this. Um, you know, how easy is it to find victims? Uh, what kind of instances are they running it on? Where, what regions are most popular? Um, and uh, kind of most importantly, um, you know, would their security groups, which is uh, similar to a firewall policy for an EC2 instance, 
um, you know, would those be configured sanely? Um, don't allow the world to connect to your SSH ports, for example, um, you know, which would be effective at, at uh, you know, being, a, being somewhat of a hedge against, uh, against an AMI that has, uh, you know, a Trojan uh, SSH daemon or uh, a, a pre-existing authorized key. Um, and then we also uh, released our tool, or well, developed our tool that we're releasing um, to perform large-scale scans of, of images uh, within the cloud. Uh, so the name of the tool is AMI Exposed. Uh, so it's kind of a pun on AMI and, uh, you know, asking a question, uh, and the tool seeks to find the answer. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a framework, essentially, for scanning uh, AMIs for these uh, credential leakage patterns. Um, I tried to follow a sort of similar model to uh, what Metasploit does, although my code's nowhere near as elegant and, uh, and nowhere near as capable as, as the stuff they've got. But in a similar, you know, in a similar vein, there's, uh, there's test modules that you can plug in to add new functionality with very little code and leverage the existing classes, the existing object model to, to add new tests. Um, so at its heart, it uses Amazon's API to automate, um, you know, the, the, the retrieval of a list of images, defining your scope of your tests, um, you know, I'd imagine common use cases would be testing all images that I own, um, you know, maybe before I make them public if I'm planning to do that. Um, you know, as, as a penetration tester, you might be interested in, uh, you know, testing all images that are owned by a specific client, um, you know, to see if you can find any other credentials being stored publicly. Um, so once the scope's generated, we basically iterate through all the images, uh, launch an instance, run tests over SSH, and record findings to a database. Um, the tool is released on our website, secureworks.com slash research slash tools. Uh, there's currently a little bit of a problem with the file that, that we're going to get corrected uh, probably Monday morning. Uh, so if you have any trouble downloading it in the meantime, I apologize for that. Um, as I said, there's, there's several test modules included at release. Uh, there's 10 to be precise. Um, you know, they check for the, the things that we've been discussing, uh, and I'm not going to keep repeating, you know, all these, these different vectors. Um, it also tests within system files, so it'll search for a number of files and then search within them for, uh, for specific strings. Uh, these strings are all definable by uh, a configuration file. You can just pop a regex in there and it'll, it'll search for that regex and, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily even need to write a new module to, uh, to add a new string that you're interested in. Um, so here's kind of the flow of how it executes. Um, up at the top there, we've got our, our scope definition phase. Uh, you can either do this manually just by, uh, just by going into the, uh, the AWS console and, and putting tags on images that you're interested in, um, or there's a tool that, uh, that's included called tagimages.rb uh, that allows you to, to define larger scopes uh, you know, more easily. You can't, can't go and click through you know, thousands of images. Um, you know, again, um, query for the tagged images, iterate over them, and uh, obviously we wanted to thread it. Um, oh, I should mention this is all in Ruby. Um, I, I didn't even say that, but uh, down the right here we have some of the gems that are used. So we're using the uh, threaded collections gem for, uh, for managing threads. Um, and then uh, we're using the, well, the official Amazon Web Service SDK for Ruby, uh, which was released about three weeks ago. So I actually kind of wrote two versions of this tool. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, writing one that interacted directly with the SOAP APIs over, X, you know, parsing the XML uh, to my own object model. Uh, I was just about done with that and about to do our, our large-scale scan when Amazon released their own SDK. Uh, it was much more elegant, uh, much cleaner, um, much more efficient, so I ported, uh, you know, I ported my code over to adopt that rather than duplicating that functionality. Um, they've also been improving it at a pretty rapid pace, so uh, there's been a couple of releases that, that have you know, made minor adjustments and bug fixes uh, you know, just in the past few weeks. Um, so once we launch the instance, we have to, uh, you know, we have to figure out what account we're going to use. So that's down there on determining SSH username. So we try and log in as root. Uh, if that fails, we, uh, you know, try and parse any response that comes back. A lot of times you log in as root and you get a response that says, you know, please use ABC instead of root. Uh, so we try and parse that from the banner. Uh, and then if that fails, we just iterate through a list of, uh, of usernames that we've discovered are commonly used out there. Um, so, you know, generally we're, we're pretty capable of, uh, you know, being able to determine the username. Uh, clicked add. And then, uh, you know, then we run our tests. So we go through uh, each of the test modules, uh, you know, load the module, we'll run it, uh, and record all the findings in the database. Um, so we're using NetSSH for the SSH components and uh, ActiveRecord for the, the database uh, component. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, demo it. Uh, it's going to take a little while to run, so we'll talk a little bit more about the internals while it's running. Uh, so give me a moment here. Apologize for the delay. Okay, you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so uh, out here, this is the, uh, the AWS uh, console. I'm showing three images. Uh, these are all images that I've created. I, I'm not. I'm not going to show anybody else's data, uh, but my own. Um, so two of these. Uh, this first one is a public image that I created. That's. Uh, an AMI that allows you to run uh, Backtrack 5 within, uh, within Amazon's cloud. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, the second one is from when I was developing that image. This is a private instance, or a private uh, image. But uh, you'll notice I scanned it previously and it's marked as failed. Um, you know, as I was iterating through the process, I, I broke the SSH daemon on this one. So it starts, but I can't SSH to it. Uh, so I just wanted to show that it flags it as failed. Um, and then the other one down there is one that I, that I made just for the uh, you know, for the demo here that, that demonstrates some of these uh, key material leakages. So I've got, I've got things there that look like real keys. They are real keys, but I'm not using them anywhere. And, you know, it's not live data. It's just for, for demonstration purposes. Uh, but you'll notice there's a tag on these, and uh, two of them are in pending state. Uh, and that's how we define our scope. Uh, so the scope of this test is those two images. Um, so let me just do this full screen. Whoops. Okay, is that still there? All right. So uh, this is actually um, I'm SSH'd into uh, into a running instance on uh, on Amazon's cloud, and that's where I did all my tests from. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that I was using the cloud to scan the cloud for security problems. Uh, so it was all taking place in Amazon's infrastructure. Um, so this is a uh, directory where I've got the tool here. Um, you'll see this tag images file that we that we talked about that that allows you know defining the scope, and then scan.rb is really the main. Uh, you know, the main uh, heart of, of, the, uh, you know, of the tool. So I'm going to go ahead and launch scan.rb. Uh, it looks a little bit weird here. My ASCII art didn't scale to this, uh, this font size. Um, so you see there it says it's storing logs for, uh, you know, each AMI under a logs AMI subdirectory. Uh, starting a test of two AMIs, I've got to configure for 13 threads, uh, but it's not going to run 13 because it's only got two images. Uh, and then just timestamp saying it's, it's scanning. So this, this probably take about 10 or 15 minutes. So we will go back and uh, come check on this. I keep doing that. Come check on this in a little while. Okay. Okay, we got through this. Sorry, I lost my spot. Okay, so while that's running, um, let me talk about some of the, uh, the things I did to expand uh, the Amazon Web Service SDK. Um, I basically just opened their, their classes and uh, defined some additional methods to, to give me the, the functionality I needed to, to do this that they didn't provide you know, through, the, uh, through the SDK. Um, so we modified the instance, added some methods to interact with instances, uh, run a command over SSH, either via SSH exec or PDY. Um, you know, and then it's got a run test method that basically loads a test module, runs it against that instance. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of fast. The slides are a little bit wordy, but that's mostly meant as a reference. Uh, I modified the image class uh, to add, a, you know, another method there. Um, added some places to store uh, parameters. We discovered that SSH user, and I need to store it somewhere. So I just store it as a tag. Um, also, that test status, you know, updates that tag that, uh, that defined our scope and, and defines the results of the test. Um, created a finding class, this really simple class, it's just backed by active record. Um, so when you, when you instantiate a finding object, it just logs it in the database. Um, and then there's a test RB is our base test class. So this is the, uh, the parent class of all the test modules. Um, it has some, some common uh, functionality that's, that's used across test modules, so you don't have to rewrite it on each one. Um, and then it implements the file helper module that, uh, that allows us to test within files, so we're not, we're not redefining that everywhere. Um, 
you know, any, any test that needs to look within a file for contents can just call this method and, uh, you know, it's already taken care of. Um, and then the individual tests themselves derive from the base test. Uh, they have an init method that just basically defines, uh, you know, some metadata, the name of the test, uh, you know, the severity of, of various findings, et cetera, and then a run method that runs the test. Um, so we're trying to keep things simple by, by you know, uh, by having a, a sound object model and, and keeping all of, well, not all, but keeping a lot of the, uh, you know, the heavy lifting out of the tests. Um, so here's an example of a test file at the end of the day. Um, this is a pretty simple one, just checks for a bash history file. If it exists, it looks within that bash history file for, um, you know, things that we've, that we've defined as, uh, you know, as, as potential key materials or credentials. Um, this one's similar here, although I got the subject, the title of the slide wrong. This one's SSH authorized keys. So this is where we're looking for uh, any authorized key file. Uh, looking within that file to see if there's any keys present other than the one that is provided through, uh, you know, through the Amazon interface. Um, so this will identify unknown keys. Um, this one's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it was an attempt at trying to catch any, uh, you know, any sort of uh, persistent connections. Um, so, you know, we're looking at a net stat and seeing if there's active connections from the host, uh, excluding a few IPs, you know, not, not going to look at loopback connections, uh, not going to look at connections that are coming from my test box, et cetera. Um, this isn't terribly effective because it has to be a really long-lived connection in order to, uh, to be caught. Uh, if you're doing something like, you know, hitting SSH and downloading a script, uh, or I'm sorry, hitting, you know, an HTTP server and downloading a script, uh, that's going to be a really quick connection and the odds that we would catch that are pretty slim. Uh, but, you know, if somebody had a, an SSH session persistent for a long period of time and, and we happen to test at the right time, there's, there's a chance. Um, so let's talk about the scope of our testing. Uh, we started with, uh, you know, the idea of looking at all U.S. East images. Uh, we removed Windows images from the scope. Um, they're generally paid images because of licensing constraints, and they're more difficult to interact with remotely because you have to do it all over RDP. It's a little harder to, to programmatically access. Um, so that left us with 5,515 non-Windows images. Um, this was the list of images that we attempted to process with the tool. Uh, there were 771 images that were paid. Uh, so you need to have an additional license, uh, pay an additional fee to use those, and we just kind of skipped those because we were trying to keep, you know, keep costs under control. Um, there was 2,767 that failed to test, and this is really kind of interesting. Uh, it seems like almost all of these were due to some sort of error with the image itself. Um, so you saw the one that I had where, you know, my SSHD was broken. That was a private image. I, you know, it's broken. Why would I make it public? Uh, but it seems like a lot of people make these public anyway. Um, so, you know, you can't, I, I couldn't act, interact with them over SSH because they won't start. Uh, you know, get kernel panics on boot, um, you know, you, you can't find the, uh, the root volume on boot, uh, SSHD doesn't work, et cetera. So we ended up with 19, uh, well, 1,977 images that were, uh, that were scanned by our tool. Uh, we had 580 uh, unique images that had one finding uh, or another. So that's 29.3% uh, of uh, the images that completed all the tests had uh, at, least, at least one security problem. Um, we shared these findings with Amazon security team. Uh, we didn't uh, verify any of, the, uh, you know, any of the credentials. We didn't attempt to use any of this stuff. Uh, so it's possible some of these have you know, been revoked or something like that. Uh, I have no way of knowing. Um, you know, and Amazon's been responsive about, uh, about trying to you know, contact the, uh, the image owners uh, and the users if it's applicable and, and uh, you know, make everyone aware and, and remove images if, if necessary, et cetera. Uh, so I really want to applaud Amazon's security team. They, uh, you know, they take this threat seriously and uh, they've, they've been, you know, tremendously cooperative with us. Um, so the largest finding was the, uh, the problem of SSH authorized keys. Um, I suspect that many of these are, uh, you know, people that just didn't, didn't realize they were there. Um, they're probably not, you know, it, it's hard to say how many of them are malicious. Uh, but the fact is, when you download an image that has a, uh, an authorized key file, whoever has that private key, um, if they can reach the SSH port, can authenticate. Uh, so there's no real way to separate what's accidental and what's malicious. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty severe finding. Um, so 19.52% of the AMIs we tested, nearly 20%, uh, had an, an unknown authorized key file. So, uh, you know, by that statistic, 
if you randomly launched five uh, you know, public AMIs, there's a good chance that somebody else has access to one of them. Um, this represented 44.96 uh, of our findings. Uh, so it's, it's far and away the, uh, the most prevalent uh, problem that we've encountered. Uh, this chart here uh, breaks down all the different findings that our various test modules uh, you know, encountered. The number of occurrences of each, the number of unique images that was affected by that finding, uh, the percentage of our, uh, of our total, uh, total number of findings that, that were represented by that class, and uh, the percentage of AMIs that had that, uh, you know, had that problem. Um, or I'm sorry, the percentage of, um, the percentage of AM, okay. So that's the percentage of um, all AMIs with findings. So if we take the number of, uh, the number of images that had unauthorized SSH keys, uh, as the numerator and the number of images that had some problem, you know, that we discovered as the denominator, those, that's what that percentage represents. Um, and, uh, you know, then we have the, the percentage of our, of our test case. Uh, so we see there again, uh, unauthorized SSH keys existed in, uh, you know, nearly 20%. Um, I believe the German, uh, German researchers, their number was 30%. Um, but uh, I'm not quite sure what the scope, they, they tested 1,000 images, we tested uh, nearly 2,000, uh, so that's gonna vary a little bit. And I'm not quite sure what region they tested. Uh, I sort of suspect it might be EU, just, you know, because they're from Germany, uh, but I'm really not sure. So, so I don't know how directly comparable our, our findings are with each other, but it seems we're both in the same ballpark. Um, our second highest finding was just the existence of a history file. Um, so, you know, that in and of itself may or may not be, a, a, you know, a significant finding. If that history file contains, uh, you know, sensitive environment variables, key materials, et cetera, we would log another finding. Um, but in some cases, the, uh, the history file might have, uh, you know, have some sensitive info that we weren't scanning for. <coughs> um, you know, the other tops there, uh, environment variables that are commonly used to point to, uh, to Amazon Web Services key materials. Uh, the access keys themselves, uh, you know, that's, that's a significant one. It's not a huge number of, uh, of images. But, uh, you know, with those keys, uh, essentially, if we'd wanted to, uh, if we were so inclined, we could have scanned until we found one of these and then continued the project, uh, you know, by using that credential and, uh, you know, reduced our cost quite a bit. But, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're not trying to be criminals here. We're just trying to gather the scope of the problem. Um, other issues, uh, SSH identity keys. So that's the actual private key, um, which is kind of, kind of unusual. Um, in at least one case, I was able to find the, uh, you know, the identity key file and then go back to the history file and find a remote host name that they'd logged into with that identity key. Uh, so chances are good if I'd used that same key against that same host, I probably would have gotten that host, um, you know, which isn't, isn't on Amazon's uh, cloud, but, uh, you know, may have had its security compromised as a result of this, uh, you know, this lax practice of, of keeping the key there. Uh, and there's various other findings, um, you know, much lower proportion. Uh, so I'm not going to discuss them all. Uh, the SSH password authentication enabled. We actually added that test as we were like, you know, most of the way done with our, uh, with our scan. So uh, those numbers are really incomplete. Uh, but that's a module that's looking for an SSHD config that has password auth enabled. Um, you know, Amazon Web Service EC2 is really built strongly around key authentication. Uh, so if you have a password authentication, now the, uh, you know, the strength of uh, passwords and accounts that are configured on the, uh, on the image comes into play. Um, so we didn't find a whole lot, but, you know, as I said, we didn't, we didn't uh, test all these with that, uh, with that test. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the costs. <coughs> uh, excuse me. The, uh, the, my Amazon Web Service bill last month was uh, $1,333. Uh, you know, I, I completed all these tests within the month, and the vast majority of that is, is due to, uh, you know, is due to this project. Um, it's a little too bad. $3.84 more, and I would have been at uh, 1337 So that would have been kind of cool. And, yeah, I wish I would have figured that out. I wonder if they'll let me overpay the bill, you know? Like, just here's 384 more. Like, uh, anyhow, if that breaks down to uh, $0.67 cents per image scanned, $0.98 cents per finding. Uh, $15.68 per uh, Amazon Web Service credential. Uh, so that seems like a bargain. Uh, you know, with a little bit more manual review, we might find that some of these things are, are you know, that, that are, are uh, 
you know, for example, a batch history file, if you were to look at it, you might be able to find other things and have more findings. Um, kind of conversely, you know, you might find that some are more false positives. Um, so our numbers are obviously rough and the, and the costs per finding are, are, you know, a little bit rough there as well. Uh, we could have leveraged spot instances to lower costs. So spot instances use uh, off-peak pricing. Uh, you know, if, if you don't care when you run a task, you can run it whenever Amazon has more capacity available at a lower cost. Um, it would have made the scripts a little bit more complex to, uh, you know, to keep state of what machines are running and not. Um, and there's also the thought of uh, analyzing the EBS boot images themselves without, um, you know, without launching the instance. Um, this might reduce costs. It might also uh, increase the amount of images we're, like, we're able to test. Uh, some of those public AMIs that wouldn't boot properly, if they have a valid EBS volume, that volume might still have data on it. Uh, you know, the fact that the machine doesn't boot doesn't mean there's, you know, no data there. Uh, and I, I sort of suspect that, you know, uh, if someone's going to go to the trouble of, uh, of making a, a broken image public, um, they're probably not going to uh, be following some of the best practices in, in securing their, uh, you know, their credentials as well. Um, so that might be interesting. And again, as I said before, um, you know, if we were malicious about this, uh, you know, we could have reduced our costs pretty greatly. Um, let me go back to our uh, test there. That should be just about complete now. Ten minutes. Oh wow. Okay, I'm gonna have to pick up the pace here. Okay, so keep changes. Okay, so this is our uh, our test here, and you can see uh, those two threads completed, uh, those tests completed. If I go into the log at AMI's directory, um, this might be a little hard to read at this uh, at this size, but let me look at the uh, the log file for the first one here. O4BE. So, yeah, it it doesn't wrap around too well here with this uh, with this size. Is that maybe I can shrink it? A, well. Anyway, you can see here, uh, you know, it starts up at the beginning, uh, launches an instance, it's got the instance ID number there, uh, attempts to SSH to it, SSH hadn't started yet, so it sleeps for a little while, discovers the SSH username, and then starts running tests. Uh, this particular image uh, didn't have any, any issues, so uh, it runs a test, completes a test, runs a test, completes a test, et cetera. Um, not a whole lot interesting there, it eventually terminates and shuts down. Um, if we look at the other, uh, the other test, this one's a little more interesting. Um, so same sort of thing, start an instance, uh, discover SSH. Now there you can see we found an unauthorized SSH key. Uh, we call that a high severity and there's the key. Um, you know, we, we checked for X509 certificates, uh, found a, a certificate file. Uh, there's the uh, file name and, and path. Um, and it just kind of continues on like that with, with the various findings. Um, these are also all stored in a database. Uh, if I go back to I'm using SQLite here, but it's active record, so you can use whatever adapter you want. Um, select star from findings, and you'll see we've got our database there, um, you know, that logs all our findings, where things were found, and the details that go along with them. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was a, a demo showing two, uh, two machines being scanned in, in real time. Um, at, at our peak, we were, uh, we were scanning about 110 images an hour. Um, now when I say scanning, that includes identifying images as paid images, which obviously doesn't take very long. Um, but yeah, that seemed like a pretty decent, uh, decent rate. It took about two days, uh, you know, two, th well, it was two and a half, three days to uh, scan, uh, you know, the entire scope of our, of our tests. Um, but the question uh, then kind of becomes, you know, the SSH keys was our, was our biggest finding. Um, don't people use security groups to protect their instances? Uh, if I have an SSH key, it shouldn't matter if I can't reach the, uh, you know, the SSH port. Um, so here's a, you know, just a slide kind of explaining uh, EC2 security groups. It's just like a firewall policy. Um, there's a screenshot there. The interesting thing is they're inbound only uh, unless you're in uh, virtual private cloud. So uh, outbound traffic uh, from a potentially uh, malicious AMI, there's really not a strong way to filter that. Uh, you could use IP tables or something on the instance, but um, you know when it's someone else's provided AMI, th at least the first time you run it, you're running their configuration. 
Um, so we did some testing of security group practices. Uh, I released these uh, AMIs across all regions uh, to allow running Backtrack 5 in EC2 uh, on June 23rd. Uh, just kind of announced it publicly in a couple of different places. Um, you know, I, I thought this was an interesting uh, sample because it's something that, uh, you know, people would, that are more security minded might be interested in. Has anybody here actually used these at all? I'm just curious. No. Okay. Well, um, it was also useful to me for gathering data and statistics. Um, there was a phone home script in it. Um, now, this wasn't a true backdoor. It wasn't anything that I could log into. I couldn't execute code in the boxes. Uh, but it did report some data back to me when it was launched. Um, here's the script. Oh, it's on the next page. Uh, so there was a script that was part of, uh, you know, part of the, the startup, collected uh, some metadata from, uh, from the EC2 metadata API and sent it back to me. Um, here's the script itself. And uh, you'll notice there there's uh, comments kind of explaining, like, you know, what we're trying to do and, and trying to calm people down that it's not real malicious. Uh, notice the curl directs the entire output to dev null, so I can't save it as a script and run it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's got a, a website there. If you have questions, visit this. Uh, the website explained it and kind of solicited feedback to say, how did you find this? Uh, you know, I'd like to uh, kind of gather processes that have been, uh, have been helpful in discovering these sorts of things. And I was planning on crediting people who had found it. Um, but as you can see, uh, nobody contacted me, nobody hit that web page. Uh, so it doesn't seem like too many people found it. Um, so we received 95 phone homes uh, as of uh, July 31st. Uh, this was 69 unique instances. And when we received a phone home, we would try and connect back on 22 and pull an SSH banner. Uh, we were successful in 71.5% uh, of cases. 72% uh, if you uh, counted it by unique instances rather than all instances uh, to get rid of the effects of people rebooting uh, an existing instance. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of concerning. Uh, that tells me that, you know, 70% of, uh, of people who are uh, presumably somewhat security minded because they're downloading backtrack after all, uh, or not downloading, but they're, you know, they're running backtrack in the cloud, um, didn't bother to, to properly uh, firewall off their SSH port. Uh, if instead of putting this phone home, uh, you know, I put the phone home in addition to the SSH key, which you'll remember was our most common finding. Um, it's a pretty safe bet that I would have had, uh, you know, had root access to, uh, you know, most if not all of these boxes. Um, so our lessons here, uh, we kind of summarized them already. Uh, one interesting thing I think is that, you know, it doesn't seem like too much of a stretch to say that the average user is probably worse off than, uh, you know, than, than our sample. Um, again, you know, more sophisticated backdoors would be harder to detect than this, uh, and nobody detected this. So. Uh, that doesn't bode well for, uh, for you know, using uh, malicious AMIs and actually finding them. Uh, when, you, when you use a public AMI, you're putting a lot of trust in the publisher. Uh, so at the very least, consider the source of the image, um, you know, who that person is. Uh, if you want to be super safe, build your own images. Um, but, you know, at, at the very least, uh, consider that images from Amazon or another trustworthy provider, uh, you know, official open source uh, maintainers, uh, may be more safe than, uh, you know, Trust in me. Thanks, Jeff. Go ahead. So, uh, as we're in the midst of this project, uh, Amazon published a number of new documents uh, given some security guidance and best practices. Um, we wanted to offer some links in our slide deck to these. So, if you are uh, if you're using their web services, we encourage you to go uh, check out all the guidance that Amazon's uh, published out there about sharing AMIs, how to do it safely, um, how to use public AMIs in a safe fashion. Um, and uh, there's a whole bunch of articles out there on this Elastic.com uh, site from Eric Hammond. Uh, so we would encourage you to check those out. There's a lot of good material out there. Um, and, and Jeff mentioned this earlier. So where would you obtain trustworthy third-party AMIs uh, besides you, you know, building them from scratch yourself? Well, Amazon themselves uh, offers su supported and maintained images. Um, you can follow the link up there or, or find it yourself. And they've got a number of images out there. Um, they have their own YUM repository, security updates, um, you know, uh, uh, product lifecycle. Um, if you want to pay for their premium support service, these are the, the images they're going to support. Um, so this, this makes a, a good option to enterprises or other organizations um, that are using their services there. Uh, there's a number of third-party vendors that also provide um, their own uh, AMI images, um, RightScale, Cloudera, a number of other vendors. 
Um, and one of the best practices we've talked to some large organizations that heavily leverage web services from Amazon is they, uh, many of them take Amazon's own images as a base and then build a customized AMI for their own application suite on top of it. And then they can leverage Amazon's lifecycle and support and package updates um, to keep their base up to date. And then just all they have to worry about is updating whatever the application code or, or other suite they added on top of that was. Um, if you find uh, issues in the cloud, uh, we had a, a really good experience working with Amazon security team. They're very responsive. Um, they're easy to get a hold of. They investigate every report. Um, so you can, uh, you can find them online. They, um, they have a form, uh, PGP keys, email addresses. Uh, it's not hard to get a hold of them. And we just wanted to uh, give thanks uh, to Beetle from the Amazon Web Services security team and the rest of his team uh, for working with us as, as we uh, did this project and uh, for working, uh, we were creating work for them as they were doing customer notifications uh, as, we, as we fed these findings to them. And also thank our bosses at Dell SecureWorks for uh, authorizing us to do this project and, uh, and giving us a little bit of budget to make it happen. We'll be moving over to the Q&A room here shortly across the hall. Uh, I'd like to meet any of y'all that are you know, using cloud services, have questions, or have some information to, to share with us. Um, so I hope some of y'all will join us in the QA uh, room across the hall. Thank you. Appreciate your time.